The title of my lesson today is Faith and Deeds. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 4. See, all throughout Christendom, faith and deeds went hand in hand. This was until the 16th century, and you had a Catholic priest by the name of Martin Luther decided he didn't like this anymore. He didn't believe that we needed to do any works. He believed that we were saved by faith alone, and he looked to some scriptures in the Bible to support this claim. Now, this started the Protestant Reformation that really affected all of the different denominations that we now have today and even has gone back and infiltrated Catholicism, this mentality that we're saved by faith alone, not by works. And you might hear this with many people if you, go, if you get in contact and study the Bible with really anyone who's been to any sort of church nowadays. It's a very common false doctrine. Now, in Romans chapter 4, it says this in verse 2. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. The Greek word here for works is the word ergon, and it means work. It's what you do. So what the Bible says is that we are not saved based on our works. We're not saved based on what we do, but we're saved by faith in Jesus. And so what Martin Luther said, he said, okay, the Bible says we're saved by faith, but we're saved by faith alone. Now, we believe in the entire Bible, and we want to understand what the entire message says. So we've got to understand the context of this. See, in Romans, this was written by Paul. He was in the city of Corinth at this time, and he was writing a letter to meet the specific needs of the church in Rome in the year 57 AD. Now, in the church in Rome, they had a problem that people thought that they could have works without faith. They thought that they could earn their salvation, which is not true. And Paul had to refute that false doctrine. But when we look at the entire Bible, we understand that before there was an issue of works without faith, there was an issue of faith without works. So if you go back in time eight years to the book of James, in James, this book was written around the year 49 AD, and it was actually the first New Testament epistle. And unlike Paul's letter to the church in Rome, James's epistle was written to the entire movement, really to all of the disciples, and it was addressing movement-wide issues. See, Martin Luther, he's not a big fan of James. In fact, he calls it an epistle of straw. Martin Luther wanted to elevate the teachings of Paul above the teachings of James, and he wanted to pick and choose which parts of the Bible he was going to follow. But we know we can't do that because we are a Bible church. We believe in the entire Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it's not about Paul or James or, or anyone. It's really about God's word and God's message. So in James chapter 2, we pick it up in verse 14. The Bible says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Now, that word deeds, it's an interesting word because in the NIV translation, sometimes they can kind of like water it down a little bit and they can pick and choose how to translate things to kind of skew the meaning of it. Remember, in Romans, the word ergon was translated as works. It's a punchy word. It has that weight to it. And funny enough, the word here for deeds in Greek is the word ergon. It's the exact same word. So I believe in consistency. If you're going to translate it as works in Romans, you've got to translate it as works in James. So let's see what it says. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no works? Ah, has a little bit more weight to it. Can such faith save them? Verse 19, you believe there is one God, good, even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without works is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for his works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his works were working together with his faith and was made complete by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by their works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for her works when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. 
Now you can see why Martin Luther would not like the book of James because it completely refutes his false doctrine of faith alone. It even says it. The only time faith alone is mentioned in the entire Bible is in James chapter 2, verse 24. And it says, you're not saved by faith alone. So we've got to understand this. We've got to have conviction. The Bible says over and over and over and over again, 10 times it says this word ergon, the word works. And so James was clearly refuting a very important false doctrine, this idea that we're saved by faith, by only believing. And when we dig a little deeper here into this, we understand what this is. Because it says in verse 22, you see that his faith and his works were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. Again, that doesn't really do it justice. What it says here, it says for the word uh, complete, it's the word teleo. It means perfected. Now, what's perfected it? This synergy, the word working together is the word synergeo, to help in work, to partner in labor. So literally what the Greek translates as, it says, you see his faith and his works were partnering together and his faith was perfected by his works. Faith and works go hand in hand. And the Bible says that if you don't have works, your faith is not made complete. It's not made perfected. And that's what it says in verse 24. You see that a person is considered righteous by their works and not by faith alone. The Greek for faith alone, it says pistis monos. And the word for monos, it means to be alone, without companion. So we see that there's this beautiful marriage between faith and works. And Roman says you need to have faith and James says you need to have works. Romans says, hey, you can't be saved just by your works. It's not about just working and earning our salvation. We know we can't do that. But James it refutes the equally false doctrine, this idea that, hey, I just believe in Jesus, pray Jesus into my heart, no problem. I go to church, I believe, I believe, I believe, but I don't do any works. Because it says in verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. The Greek word here for spirit is the word pneuma. This is what we know is this is John chapter 4. It says this is our essence of who we are. If we just have a spirit but no body, what are we? We're a ghost. And that's my question for you today. Do you have ghostly faith that has no body, that has no substance, that has nothing to show that's perfected? See, this is what James was coming up against. And this is what we have to fight against. I don't know if you've been watching Netflix during the quarantine. I have, and it's been greatly encouraging me in my faith because there's this wonderful story about Michael Jordan. It's called The Last Dance. If you're not watching it, you should watch it. See, Michael Jordan, he had great faith. He believed that he could become the greatest basketball player of all time. And he said, hey, I need to compete with the likes of Larry Bird. I need to compete with the likes of Magic Johnson. I need to be a champion. And he believed that he could be a champion. In 1984, he was a first-round draft for the Chicago Bulls. Now, the Chicago Bulls at this time were trash. They were so bad. But Michael Jordan didn't care. He still had faith. He believed, and he went after it. And that year, they didn't win the championship. So, okay, I'm, I have faith. I believe we're going to do it next year. And next year, they didn't win the championship. Again, didn't win. Then finally they get to the playoffs and they play against the Detroit Pistons. And what happens, the Pistons beat them. And then they beat them again. And then they beat them for a third year in a row. So after six years of believing that Michael Jordan could become the greatest basketballer, he could become a champion, he could lead his team to win a championship, he realized, hey, my faith is still strong, but I'm not doing enough works to be able to prove my faith. What did he need to do? He's like, hey, I need to do weights. I've never lifted weights before, but I need to get physically stronger. I need to get bigger. I need to have more muscle. And in three months, he put on 15 pounds of muscle. He had, a uh, he had his personal uh, trainer come on in. He says, hey, give it a 30-day trial. 30-day trial. If it works, go for it. That personal coach said, hey, that 30-day trial turned into a 15-year lifestyle. See, we can't just have faith for little spurts. Sometimes we're like, we have faith, and then the miracle doesn't happen, and then we lose our faith. 
We know that's wrong. We know that we got to have consistent faith. But in the same way, we can't just have spurts of work, sharing blitzes, evangelism pushes. I'm going to pray and fast, and I'm going to share with 100 people, and then never share my faith again. Because if I share with 100 people on Monday, I don't have to share for the rest of the week. See, Michael Jordan understood that for him to achieve his dreams, for him to really show everyone what he believed in, he had to put in the work. And this is what we need to do. See, Michael Jordan, he was the top scorer in the NBA, but he wasn't a champion. And he, instead of focusing on other people, instead of pointing at his teammates or his coach or, or the league or whatever, he realized, hey, I need to take personal responsibility. I need to show my faith to be proven genuine based on my work. And I know I'm the hardest worker in the NBA right now, but I need to work even harder. He realized that as hard as he was working, it wasn't hard enough because he wasn't really achieving his goals. I think some of us, we fake ourselves out and we think like, okay, I am working, Colby. You don't understand. I do share my faith. I do follow up. I do get Bible studies. Well, are you fruitful? Because the Bible says that if we abide in the vine, we'll bear much fruit. And if you believe that scripture, that means that you'll be doing the works to prove it true. And there should be an abundance of fruit. The Bible says much fruit, not some fruit. So you gotta ask yourself, if you're not bearing much fruit in your life, it's because either there's a lack of belief or there's a lack of works. Now, for myself, is that I have struggled with both of these. I've had times where I've really struggled and doubted the Bible, but usually that's not my issue. I'm more of a uh, believe in Jesus type of guy, but don't really have the works to back it up. And this is what is shown in my life is that, hey, I can believe in Jesus, I can preach the word, I can sing the songs and everything, but if I'm not putting in the work necessary every single day, I'm not going to get the results. And so I wanna challenge you to have a real honest and sober look at yourself, to say, hey, am I bearing much fruit to show God's glory? Because it's not about making disciples for your glory, it's about God's glory. It's about showing your faith and deeds working together in a perfect harmony. And if you don't believe, you need to repent of your unbelief because unbelief is a sin. And Revelation 21.8 says, if, you, uh, if you're unbelieving, you're gonna burn in hell. So if you're struggling with unbelief, repent. But I think that we have many, many more people that are struggling with putting in the work. We have people now that are struggling with laziness. I read on the Telegraph that during the quarantine, Britain is living a life of leisure. Netflix has gone up. Sleeping has gone up. Gardening has gone up. Family time has gone up. Everyone is staying at home and they're spending more time focusing on themselves. That can't be us as disciples. We can't be living a life of leisure. We can't be focused on ourselves. We can't be focused on ourselves living a life of leisure. Leisure, we need to make sure that we're going out and doing the work, going out and making disciples. So my brothers and sisters, I want to challenge you. If you are not believing in the Bible, you need to repent. You need to believe in the Bible. But if you're not doing the work to show your belief to be true, to show it to be proven genuine, it's time for us to do the work. It's time for us to get after it. There's so much we can do. The lockdown's loosening up. We can go out. We can start evangelizing. We can go on social media. Facebook, Instagram, Bumble, all of these things are free. They're freely available for us, and we need to go after it. So, my brothers and sisters, I want to challenge you. Put in the work to prove your faith genuine.